All right. <clears throat> it's already hot and it's 821. Cut. Cut. This is actually something else I care a lot about. I know that sounds weird. I'm like, who cares about the scientific method? But I, I do. <laughs> it's not because I'm a nerd. It's because I think it's misunderstood and been misapplied um, and abused and all that over the last two years. So I just typed this super profound thought up right here. And it is this. Changing one's mind when presented with new information is not a sign of weakness in the individual. It is a sign of strength and maturity. And then I have a smart man changes his mind. And I have the little asterisk because anyone know why I have that right there? Any guesses? What I have? Oh, that, that is on my wall, right? And let me briefly tell you about that quote. That quote is actually from my, he, I call him my uncle, but he's my dad's cousin, but my dad had no brothers. So like Mike's pretty much my uncle. Mike is, he lives in Texas. And he's probably the person I look up to the most of any male in my life. I got my mom, probably number one, then Mike and do some whatever, like, I don't know, my dad's kind of low on that list, but whatever. Um, Mike served in the Vietnam War for four years. Most people did one. He was in the Green Berets, and he won't tell you almost anything that he did. He killed a lot of people. Um, lived in the hills of Vietnam for a long time. And he was telling me a story once about how he had done, done some reconnaissance with some people and they discovered a huge amount of NVA troops. And I don't know huge, he never said numbers. Um, and that he reported that, but a general didn't really care and still sent a very small amount of men to try and attack that. And that a ton of them died because that man wouldn't change his plan even though he was presented with data to show him it was gonna be a disaster. And he said, Tom, a smart man changes his mind. And I thought, that's, that's crazy, like, like cool. It really hit me hard. That, that guy got new data, knew something was probably gonna fail, but since he already had a plan, he went with it in your life. You're going to always have a plan. And a lot of times you're going to get data that's going to prove it's going to fail. I would encourage you most of the time to change your plans. <laughs> change your mind when presented with new information and data. Now, why this, this is a hot topic for me. If I move this, uh oh, oh no, it's just slow. Crap. I don't know why it won't move the square. That's a rectangle. Don't at me, Cedric Monson. All right. This is where it gets controversial. I don't know why, but changing guidance. So when you get new guidance from a group of scientists in a pandemic is not a sign of weakness or distrust or stupidity or anything like that. It is the application of the scientific method. New observations lead to new knowledge and new guidance. This is a strength of the scientific method, not a weakness. In the last two years, I can't believe how many people have just stopped trusting science. Um, and sure, is there bias in science? Absolutely, there can be. Um, last year, I taught this when we came to school. It was the first two weeks and we had masks and people gave me a lot of arguments that at the start of the pandemic, Mr. Fauci said, you don't need to wear a mask. And you know what? That's true. He did. If you play the video that everyone plays, he said, 
but this is an ever-changing disease. And if we get more information, that might change. That's his full quote. When coronavirus first started, they did not think it was an airborne transmission because that's not that common in that type of illness. So there was not there was no need based on the data we had there to do the things that we were doing. At the start of the pandemic, like in China, they were like spraying every single road and scrubbing it with disinfectant. Well, that's a waste of time. We've learned that that's not something you need to do. You noticed your teachers are not cleaning your desks every year, right? Or every hour, I mean. And that's because fomite transition has been pretty much been proven is not the way that the coronavirus um, is transmitted. But that doesn't mean that they were idiots. It means they were going on the data they had at the time, which was data from other types of illnesses that were similar. Everything changes. If we only had one set of rules at the start and it never adjusted, that would be the weakness. That would be stubborn. And that would be the smart man not changing his mind when he knows new information and it's going to fail, right? We don't just run every red light because at one point it was green. The light changed. So what do we have to do? We have to adapt. We have to stop. Okay, so please, if you get anything from today's discussion, please realize that science gets new information and we have to change based on that information. Um, all right, I don't know if hopefully this part works. All right, there's two articles, but I talked a lot about 9-11, so we don't have time. But this just show, this one talks about how the whole last year and a half has been a good display on how the scientific method works and that it struggles and that it's messy and that it's collaborative and that it can change, but that that's what science does. All right, and then this one says, scientists still don't have all the answers about the coronavirus and that's a sign of progress. Now that's a year and a half old right there, but it talks about that we don't just jump to conclusions um, and leave them the way they are. Okay, we adjust based on experimentation and observation. All right, so here we go. I'm going to go pretty quick through the notes if you're okay with that, because I took way too long already. Scientific method starts with stating a problem. The problem is what you want to figure out. Essentially, this is page number six. They're not all bolded in this presentation, I guess. Sorry about that. So something's considered a problem if its solution isn't obvious. So like the COVID-19 is one of the greatest examples of having a problem where the solution is not obvious. The problem is usually in science, we have problems and we have plenty of time to figure them out. And we research it, we, we review the research, we do more trials till we become very confident. And then you release like, hey, smoking's not good for you. You shouldn't do it. And that, that like took 60 years for people to really admit smoking wasn't good for you. But they had a lot of data to support that hypothesis. All right. Well, the problem with COVID-19 is it, it kills people like in three weeks, <laughs> not 30 years after you get lung cancer. So it <clears throat> demanded solutions to the problem as quick as they could get them. And people were willing to go off of any hypothesis pretty quickly. And a lot of those have been proven wrong, both that professionals recommended and non-professionals recommended. All right, so anyway, now we have a problem. We wanna figure it out by finding information. Okay, so once you have a problem, then you collect information on the problem. So COVID-19 is considered a coronavirus, just like thousands of other coronaviruses. So science people started learning as much as they could about the coronavirus, All right? Most of you had never heard of the coronavirus before 2019, right, or 2020. Well, the common cold is from the coronavirus, but we don't worry about it because that one 
you're sick for a couple of days, may have a fever and you're fine. But this one evolved, it's a little bit different. All right, so you collect information so you can know the problem as good as you can. Then you make a hypothesis. Use what you know about the problem to predict the solution and try it. Okay, now here's, here's the weakness um, of the last year and a half. People make hypotheses fast and the scientist tries it and then somehow someone tells someone and then all of a sudden you're doing crazy stuff. Like right now, um, there's a, a trend, and I don't know how to pronounce it, but of taking uh, animal drug uh, to help you if you get the coronavirus. It's called intervectin or something like that. It's to get rid of worms in animal intestines. But some scientists in Denmark, and this is normal, they're not idiots by any means. They thought, hey, we have read that ivermectin or whatever it's called um, can have antiviral effects. So they did a study in a lab and they found out that it can kill viruses. And so that was released and people read, hey, ivermectin can kill the coronavirus, which they proved in Denmark, but they didn't read the rest. Even the scientists in Denmark are saying, no human should repeat this trial because it was like 20 times the concentration that they give a horse. We <laughs> were like a tenth the size of a horse. And the scientists are like the that did the study, like you can't do this um, and really be healthy. And so, but all someone read was the headline that said ivermectin helps treat coronavirus. Um, and now it's hard to find at a pet supply store. <laughs> and it's fine, like in the long run, maybe they will find data to support it. But as of right now, um, it's, it's mostly a poison and it makes people extremely sick. But that's an example of how a hypothesis was tested and tried, but it never was really repeated and refined. All right, so I'm already going slower than it was, but whatever. You look for patterns that help you make predictions about the problem. And that's what they did with Corona, the COVID-19. Um, they thought, hey, the other ones behaved like this. Most of the time they're from direct contact. They start from an animal to a human, then a human to a human. The problem with COVID-19 is we still don't 100% know how it's transmitted. It is assumed and there's plenty of data to support the hypothesis that it is an airborne. Um, and that's what makes it tricky. The other hard part about Corona is most likely, I'm not being a downer, but there's probably someone in here right now who has it and has zero idea, zero symptoms, zero anything, and never will. Um, but you're breathing it out and someone might, might get it. It's, it's tricky. So if it's airborne and the carriers of it have no idea they have it, uh, that's a really good way to have an extremely infectious disease breakout. All right, make a model or representation of what you're working with, break down the problem into smaller, simpler problems. Now we're talking a lot, I am talking a lot about just the COVID-19, but really you'll, you do the scientific method all the time. Like I'm gonna use Maddie's sister for an example. She's a setter in volleyball. And what, what is it called when she doesn't set it? She just throws it over, is that a dump? Okay. Um, so her sister, she doesn't ever do it on the first play of the game. I've never seen her do it, but what Ashton's really good at, and her sister Morgan was pretty good at it too, is as, as they take in information about the defense, they're analyzing kind of their behaviors and on certain plays, Ashton can see that, Hey, I think the best thing to do instead of setting it to someone to hit it is just do a quick little, they just go straight over the side. It's really cool when it works because it makes the other team look dumb. Like, do you even know how to play volleyball guys? <laughs> All right, it's called the dump. 
she wouldn't do that if she hadn't observed where they're moving and predicting what they're going to do and knows the probability of success is high. We use the scientific method in sports all the time. We use the scientific method as parents all the time. Who's the oldest in their family? Your host, because you are the experiment. And that's unfortunate. <laughs> Uh, it worked out for us. Derek's incredible. We just, we got lucky with Derek. That was pretty amazing. Uh, but we, a lot of trial and error and a lot of being wrong. I'll tell you that. A lot of being wrong as a parent. Uh, but you learn, you adjust. You do it in school. You think, hey, if I do this hairstyle, am I going to get more friends? Or if I go to lunch this way, will I run into my cute love of my life or whatever? Like we, we analyze and adjust constantly in our life. Okay, now we perform an experiment. Once we have the problem, we've collected data, we've made a hypothesis, then we actually do the experiment. We need to do an experiment that makes a solid conclusion about your hypothesis. And this is the problem a lot in high school. Well, not high school, in like seventh grade ACYI science fair project, you come up with an idea and then you test something that actually doesn't prove what you wanted anyway. Oh. This is where I skip the if then part, huh? It's about to get confusing in the notes, but whatever. Anyway, make one that supports your ideas. Okay, next, make a conclusion. A conclusion is a solid, sorry, a solid conclusion is related to the hypothesis and based on the results of a well-designed experiment. So I did skip a little bit there. And this is a really big problem right now. Scientists are forming hypotheses and doing tests and other people are jumping to a conclusion. And it's, it's not a weakness of them. We want answers fast. You know, I, I stayed away from my mom basically for a year and a half. I, I like my mom. I'd like to hang out with her, but I hang out with you. Every day I got 150 kids in some state of health um, and I'd hate to know that I transported from here to my mom, a disease that she would eventually die from like that. That would, that suck. So anyway, make a conclusion. Don't make conclusions to other people's data. That's my advice there. Okay, down lower, we'll go pretty quick. Experimental design concepts. All right, what these are is if I am going to design an experiment, these are the things that if I will think of them, it will make my experiment valid, okay? A science experiment is designed so that only one variable is being tested at a time. So if we go back and don't, don't tell Derek, but like here's Derek now, I think he's a pretty decent looking kid. Do you remember the, the before picture? And it wasn't that he was ugly, but he had some acne, right? In his teeth, he had braces, whatever. He has a decent personality. Well, let's go to like sixth grade, and you don't know Derek because he's older than you, but he was he was a little bit bigger. <laughs> he got the out before up, you know, that puberty. Uh, then he had really bad teeth, love him, had pretty bad act. He was not the best looking sixth grader. Well, right now, all those things have changed. And could we say which one of them led him to be the student body president? No, too many things have changed since sixth grade. Okay, like you're like, oh, I need more dates. Um, so I'm gonna do an experiment. I'm gonna shower, brush my teeth, look people in the eye and be more friendly. Well, in science, which one made the difference? We don't know, all of them probably, but I couldn't prove, hey, showering gets me more dates. I could if I stayed just as awkward and just as ugly, but at least I showered every day, then I could try it. We wanna only change one variable and test that. Okay, so to do that, we do these things. A variable is something that has changed to study how this change affects the time uh, being studied or the, the outcome being studied. So we change one thing if we can. By changing only one variable, when you make your conclusion, you can be assured that it is only that one variable that's causing the effect. So if I wanna prove that Mountain Dew helps plants grow better. So I have two plants and I give Mountain Dew to one and water to the other but the Mountain Dew one I keep in the sunlight and the other one I keep in my closet next to the space heater. And that one dies, then the Mountain Dew one lives. 
that's pretty obvious data that Mountain Dew helps in water kills. But the problem is I gave it no light and no, no ability to survive. It was too hot and too dry, even though I gave it water. So we can't change too many things. Okay, these are really important. They're going to be matching terms and they're gonna be things we use all year. So we have what we call the independent variable. That is the IV. That's the variable that is purposely changed by the experimenter. So if I do an experiment, I change the IV. Um, next, the dependent variable is the variable that responds and is the variable that is measured. So in my experiment, the IV would have been the liquid. One was Mountain Dew, one was water. The dependent variable would have been like how tall the plant grew or how many leaves it had or something like that. The thing you measure at the end to see if anything happened. Constants are all factors that are kept the same during the experiment. Constants are extremely important. That's another problem with this, this ivermectin controversy. Um, they did it in a Petri dish. A Petri dish and a body are extremely different with lots of different factors. So they need more time to prove whether that's healthy or not. And at right now, people are taking too high of a dose and it's making them very sick. Control, that's the standard to compare the experimental effect against. Not every experiment has a control, but a control if you take like psychology or health, it's the placebo. If they're gonna test a new medicine, they give half the people the medicine, half um, a placebo where they think they're taking the medicine. And then they see if there was really something that helped with the control group. All right. Repeated trials, that's the number of objects or organisms undergoing treatment for each value of the independent variable or the number of times the experiment's repeated. The more you repeat something, the more your data is dependable. So and I'm not trying to do anything here. I'm gonna say with the vaccine, there's hundreds of millions of people that have taken it now. That would be the repeated trials. We can look at the data from those. That's hundreds of millions, maybe even over a billion people have taken the vaccine. We have a lot of data on it now. Um, oh, is that really all the experimental design concepts? Okay, we'll call it good. Tomorrow, Monday, we're gonna fill in these tables and do what we do. You guys are fantastic, thanks for your respect during my conversation earlier about 9-11. If you're watching this, we had a short day.